Good morning, Matt. Welcome to the DMZ, everybody. Uh, Tuesday morning, a little early, but I missed you. I missed you last week, so it feels like a long time. It has been a long it time. Feels like a long time. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Phil, I had um, I have to tell you a little bit about uh, about my week without you. Um, and there's a political tie-in, and and you're not gonna like it. Mm. But first, let me just talk about what we did. Okay. So my kids head off for spring break. And instead of gallivanting like you do, going to like some island somewhere in the Caribbean, <laughs> we decided to do a road trip in our backyard, Bill. So we went to we Wait, drove, a real road trip, a real just us in a car with our kids listening okay. to pod, you know, listening to the podcast and, and, and Bruce Springsteen songs. Um, we drove to Stanton, Virginia which is wildly underrated. This is the Woodrow Wilson birthplace and nice. museum. Nice. Not to be confused with the Wilson House, which is in Washington, D.C. That's where Woodrow and Edith lived after he was president. Okay. Have you this been is, there? It's worth going to as well. In fact, our friend David Frum, I think, is speaking there uh, shortly in the next uh, few weeks, I think. Uh, but Stanton, highly recommend it. Great, aside from the Woodrow Wilson stuff, which was good, Great restaurants. There's a Shakespeare theater there. We got this cool like Airbnb right next to the Woodrow Wilson birthplace. Uh, had a great time. Then we went down to uh, this resort called Primland, which I didn't know. It was it's only about 30 minutes from Mayberry, Mount Airy, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And I would have extended the trip had I done due diligence, but mm -hmm. I didn't know. Uh, and then hit Charlottesville on the way back. Did a tour of UVA toward uh monroe's house i think it's called highland um and that was kind of our trip J J so, james monroe yes not not monroe from too close for comfort <laughs> not, not jim j bullock um to, if anyone a, was confused that's a, that's a deep pull matt <laughs> <laughs> i mean you know every time i see monroe on this trip that's exactly who i'm thinking of <laughs> but but bill what I learned, and then the next day I had lunch with my mom, okay? Uh, it's part of our whole spring break thing. Is, that, is this the part that's going to make me sad, talking to you talking to your mom? It's a tie-in. So I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to give away any names of, of people <laughs> that I met with. But on this trip, I, uh, I had, had uh, dinner with uh, someone that I know from the conservative movement who is involved in politics. Um, who, for political reasons, has you know has to be a Trump person in the Republican Party. But at dinner, I discovered this person is a true believer in Trump, hardcore, right? You, you didn't know beforehand. I would have assumed that anybody that I like and get along with, if they have to play the game, fine. But under their breath, they would say, "Can't stand that bastard." Right. Got to do what I got to do. Not the case. Um, then I went and uh, met another friend and colleague of mine who also Trump. Um, then, uh, and this is all anecdotal, but mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, but then, then I had lunch with mom and I, I've not brought up politics with her in at least a year. But you may recall after January 6th, she was like, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm done with this. Mm hmm. So I took the kids, we had lunch, and about halfway through, and it kind of ruined lunch. And I said, like, just out of curiosity, where are you with Trump? If the election were held today, mm -hmm. and she's she's back on board, Bill. Um, and this is, again, totally anecdotal. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you, it's as if January 6th was 20, it didn't even happen, right? Mm -hmm. Never mind four years ago. It's like... People, all the people that they've found reasons to go back to Trump. But, again, but your mom, your mom voted for Trump twice, right? I think she voted for him in 2016, did not vote for him and didn't vote for anybody in 2020. Okay. And then after January 6th was like, now I'm 100 mm percent -hmm. off the reservation. So do you do you know? <laughs> Does she have a different view of January 6th or just is this even come up? It's just it's just out of sight of mind for her at this point. No, I brought it up, but it's 
you know, Joe Biden's this, this was the latest excuse. It's that Joe Biden's not sticking with Israel enough or that with Netanyahu. Um, my my belief is that this is they're looking whatever there's, they're going to find an excuse. Sure. To support yeah, I, Trump. I'm not expecting a whole lot of Republicans to abandon Trump and vote for Joe Biden or stay home. So like none of that really shocks me. Um, but it doesn't make me think, oh, no, all is all is done. I mean, it, it, the, the question really is, is, is Biden losing people who voted for Biden in 2020? I mean, that's that yeah. would be the bigger concern. Uh, and, you know, polls suggest that he is right now. Um, but we just can't know uh, how firm that really is. Are you, are, if, are you on the left and you're mad about Israel Gaza? And so you don't want to say you're going to vote for him today but the situation looks differently you know six months from now or it doesn't but you realize look it's really a binary choice here and i guess can't do trump and so you you, you come you come back just like republicans are coming back into the poll uh so uh i have seen in the national polling biden is ticking up uh so which i, I you not to say like it's all a glide path from here but I think the notion that somehow like these numbers are static is wrong. We I think we got a lot of twists and turns between now and November. And by, and by, when I say twists and turns, I think like very minor moves <laughs> in the polling averages that we'll all get overexcited about because the race is so close. Um, I agree with. I think what you said is is perfectly good analysis and and talk me down, you know, bring me back. Um, but from a personal standpoint, Bill, I just have to tell you, you would think that I would be used to this by now. We've been dealing with Trump since 2015. And, you know, I had the whole thing where, like, before the 2016 election, I talked to my mom on the phone the night before. And I said, like, listen, you know, I know these people, I work in this business. I feel like Trump has strong authoritarian tendencies that he wants to be a dictator. And she voted for him the next day. <laughs> um, it's like I work and, and I've talked about it, like I work in this business. If I had like, OK, I did. I had a cousin who was a plumber and he worked in Frederick, Maryland, where I lived. And there was a, a Mexican restaurant in town. And he said, never eat there. He's like, I wouldn't even get a drink in this place. I've I've worked there. And like, I'm like, I wasn't going to be like, well, that's what you think. But, I, you, you know, you're an elite. And I was like, fine, I will never, ever set foot in this restaurant. Um, but I guess it doesn't apply if what you do is what I do. But uh, it, even everything you said, I'll, I'll grant you that it has still been um, all these years later. It, it, it remains frustrating and saddening to me to have people that I that I love. Um, who and respect in many ways who don't care. I'm not, I'm not saying you have to vote for Biden, mm. but it's hard for me to continue to respect somebody mm. who's going to vote for Trump. That's just where I am because he has been so outrageous and egregious. Well, let, me, let me ask you a question. How has your media diet changed? In the last 10 years, Matt Lewis, like how much of your media diet pre-Trump was conservative media and how much of it is conservative media today, roughly speaking? Good question. And first off, I would concede, I think that, so I think your media diet has always mattered. I think it matters more now than it mm -hmm. ever did. Right. Um, I was always very balanced. Mm -hmm. I would say that, you know, even 10 years ago, I was on when I used to do Fox News, but I was on MSNBC more than I was on Fox News. And I've always really liked NBC and MSNBC. But uh, I would say that probably, but I used to listen to Rush Limbaugh. Um, and I definitely used to watch more Fox News than I watch now. Like I used to love Special Report with Brett Baer. I used to watch it every night. As recently as a couple of years ago, I was a big fan of that show. And now I don't watch it at all. I just really can't stomach like, it. Is there I, any talk radio conservative that you listen to every day now or sometime during the week? 
Um, do we count Jonah Goldberg and Steve no. Steve Hayes? Okay, no, then no. I do not. <laughs> then no. Then it, no. It, it, I mean, as far as this combination <clears throat> is concerned, because what, what I'm getting at is, as you might uh, tell, uh, if these friends of yours and family members, if, if their diet hasn't changed, and they're still mainly listening to Fox News or listen to Hannity or Mark Levin or who have you, like their perception, not just of Trump, but of Biden, like Biden is is an ogre, uh, is, is is both a devious demon <clears throat> and, you know, uh, falling apart from dementia at the same time yeah. uh, in one of these venues. So like how you're balancing the pros and cons is totally skewed if that is what your your primary or your primary information sources are. And you're not in that ecosystem as much anymore. Uh, so you're, so I, I say, but have, I, but have a little reason, sympathy for your for your friends and family. Well, because, okay, so a couple things though. It's not like I quit watching Fox News and became a liberal. Right. I had to quit watching Fox News because they started defending a guy who tried to overturn an election mm -hmm. and and summoned a mob to the cap to storm the capitol. Mm -hmm. So I didn't leave them, they left me. Sure. I think that's an important distinction. <laughs> so obviously media diet does matter and I think it influences us no matter how much we try uh to avoid that. But you said something that I think is absolutely right. Like people keep coming to me and they'll say like <clears throat> First of all, they think Joe Biden is pure evil, mm -hmm. and I just don't get it. I don't love Joe Biden. I think he's way too old. I disagree with him, I'm sure, on a lot. But the idea that he's evil, it just seems insane to me. And so then they'll come to me with things I agree with. Like, they'll say, did you see that NPR piece? There was a guy from NPR who says it's too liberal. As if that is like dispositive evidence that I should vote for Trump. And I'm like, A, I've known this my whole life. Mm -hmm. Not new news mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. um, baked into the cake. And B, how does that compare with Donald Trump trying to steal an election mm -hmm. and summoning a mob? Like, they feel like this is like they're dropping like major news on me that mm -hmm. how could you support these people and i'm like again already factored into the equation mm -hmm. i don't think it's as problematic as donald trump in the grand scheme of things so it's a matter well, of prioritization partly well, let, 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 let's segue into trump's handling of abortion this week because i do think it has some relevance to this question about how why people are siloing themselves and um Taking you know, taking in their information from selective information sources and creating these caricatures. Uh, so, because you might think, well, I'm going to stick with Trump because I'm a conservative and he's with me on the culture war. Um, but here he is trying to triangulate on abortion. Uh, but do you, I, I'm, I'm going to assume that you don't think he's really running much of a risk in losing any votes on the social conservative uh, wing of the party because he, because the bond he's built with them is already so strong. Is that a fair assumption? Or do you think he is taking a gamble here? No, I think you're absolutely right. He has them in his hip pocket, which means he has complete you know, carte blanche authority to tax center left, whatever he wants to do, he can get away with. Now, so so I think, I, and I, and I think it is smart politics and I know it's hard to say. Well, I don't, what I don't doing. think it's smart politics, but go on. <laughs> um, well, that's interesting. Do you want, let, let's show some of the clips and then I'd love sure. to hear you uh, talk about them as we go. And then at the end, I want you to tell me why you don't think it's smart politics. So his his statement it wasn't really a speech per se. It looked like there were a lot of different, you know, it was cut up. Uh, and I'm sure he's reading a teleprompter. But um, we've, we've, I've clipped it into three segments. Uh, let's start with the first. People have asked me what my position is on abortion and abortion rights especially since I was proudly the person responsible for the ending of something that all legal scholars, both sides, wanted and 
in fact, demanded be ended. Roe v. Wade. They wanted it ended. I, there's, there's, there's so much in that that's ludicrous. And it was a very short clip. <laughs> <laughs> the notion that he did something that not just that everybody agreed on, but I, conservative Republican Donald Trump, were just doing the bidding of the legal scholars. We conservatives always do what the legal scholars tell us to do. We are so enthralled by our academic elite. And the legal scholars told us, you have to get rid of Roe v. Wade. You I, gotta I get demand rid of it. it. I demand you do it. So I'll just, do you, I'll just follow orders, kids. So do you think, is this Trump being like does he truly believe that's true or is this not. sort of wish is this sort of wish casting where he is trying to redefine the past well he's definitely it's definitely a retcon i mean we all know what actually happened what actually happened is trump wrapped up the nomination in may of 2016 in a matter of days because this is a point where he had some problems with social conservatives. You know, Ted Cruz had won Wisconsin not too long before uh, the primaries effectively ended. Uh, he puts out a list of judges, named people, saying, this is the list of people I'm going to choose from for the Supreme Court, which no one had ever done before running for president. And they're all scrubbed, hardcore uh, conservative types. Actually, James James Monroe, I learned this weekend, actually, the Federalist Society also gave him a list. But other than that, <laughs> unprecedented. Well, I did, my t I did my dissertation on James Monroe, so of course I know that. Um, and then in October of 2016, in, in one of the debates, Trump says, I am going to name judges who are going to overturn Roe v. Wade. It is, is, it is a campaign pledge. He wins the presidency uh, and proceeds to do exactly that. He puts on three just justices on the Supreme Court, the last one at the, the last minute. And within months, they overturn Roe v. Wade. Uh, so it's not like it came from the ether. He proposed it and did it. Uh, so, I mean, so, so on one hand, Matt, like, on paper, it's smart politics to find the middle because the hardcore pro-life position is not popular. It never was popular to overturn Roe v. Wade. Uh, it's not popular what's happening in some of these states. Um, uh, we've seen every time this has been put on the ballot since Dobbs, the abortion rights side has won. These are states that are blue or purple or red. Um, so, so technically, yes, he should, he should triangulate here. But you can't remove the fact that he did it. He is the guy, the driving force that made the overturning of Roe happen, which he has to cop to. And even though he tried to kind of pawn it off to the legal scholars, he's still saying, I'm proud to have done it. Like, he can't All right. shake that. And so well, it undercuts everything else that follows. Because if you're trying, show some <clears> the other <throat> clips. Show the, I know you have more clips. Well, let me just, let me say this real quick. <laughs> I think... I think you're wrong, even though you're, they have him on tape saying it. But look, social conservatives are going to give him as much leeway as he wants because Agreed. he owns Agreed. them. And think of it this way, though. Here's, here's the other part. This is why I think it works. Moderates and normies, just suburbanites, deep down, they know that Donald Trump is not really pro-life. Well, this, this, this is down, where I part with you. This is where I part with you. But that, deep it's down. Not they, it's not they don't believe it's pro-life, but they both... But the, the proof is in the pudding that has been eaten. Like, he did it. I disagree. He already, he already did what they wanted him to do. So it's much harder now to say, like, oh, uh, we're, I'm having this fight with the right over here. We don't agree what to do next. Uh, but, like, I, we know I at the end of the day people... who, we, who, you, who you're going to slew. It's not the legal scholars. It's all those anti-abortion guys much... who, who got you in the office in the first place. I think you're giving people too much credit. You're saying they're supposed to know that he nominated three justices. And because those three justices overturned Roe, that Trump is complicit in doing that. And what I'm saying is Trump seems like a pro-abortion 
pro-choice kind of guy. In fact, most people probably think Trump paid for abortions um, <laughs> himself. He well, doesn't the, feel like Mike, he's not Mike Johnson. Well, they even if voters don't like intrinsically know all the narrative that I just put out there, and we can get into these, I know we get these clips too, like there are certain people who are going to remind voters they, yeah. that with needs what to happened happen and if, put a lot of money right. behind that argument. And let me just put on the asterisk. I personally think Roe was wrongly decided and was bad, uh, but we're talking about politics. Let's go yes. to the next clip. Um, here we go. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both, and whatever they decide must be the law of the land, in this case, the law of the state. Many states will be different. Many will have a different number of weeks, or some will have more conservative than others, and that's what they will be. At the end of the day, this is all about the will of the people. You must follow your heart or, in many cases, your religion or your faith. Do what's right for your family and do what's right for yourself. Do what's right for your children. Do what's right for our country and vote. So important to vote. There, there, there's, there's so much, there's so much ridiculousness in this. And, and I, I, so forgive me if I'm trying to like piece out exactly what I want to, what I want to say about it. But just you before this, he, he's already said on multiple occasions that this is all about politics. It's about winning elections, which he even said it in the, in the statement. Uh, you know, he's trying to tell social conservatives Hey, we got Ruby Wade. You know, we got we got that uh, ended. We, we we gotta win elections here. We you you can't you, you gotta have exceptions for a rape, uh, incest, life of the mother. Uh, you can't you can't do these total bans because uh, we, we gotta win elections. So he's already portraying that it's not some sort of governing principle. It's not at all about what he believes. Yeah, it's he not is even, saying it's he's not even saying about, openly uh, it's about winning. It's not even about federalism. Like he doesn't even. Have exactly. a deep belief that exactly. states should be, yeah. It's got nothing to do with that. It's about winning this election, which makes it, which makes them vulnerable to the counter argument is you don't believe in anything. And we know what you do when you're in office. When you're in office, you appoint judges that ban abortions. So I don't care what you say. What you say is meaningless. This is what you did. And he has to go, and, and I mean, the whole notion of like, well, it's just going to be to the states. Like, and, and I'll tell you one thing: like, he's actually been, he's had all sorts of abortion positions over the course of his life, but he has actually been relatively consistent about kicking it to the states. He was saying that in 2016 uh, when he was saying I went over to, over a reway, and, and then I mean, the states will handle it. So, like, that's been something he's been comfortable saying for a, a long time. And it's uh, in a vacuum. It sounds. A knock goes, well, yeah, if you're a liberal and you're in a liberal state, you'll have abortion. If you're a conservative, you're in a conservative state, you want to have abortion. Like, everyone's going to be happy with that. Here's the problem. There are purple states that he has to campaign in. He's got a campaign in Florida. He's got a campaign in Georgia. He's got a campaign in North Carolina. He's got a campaign in Arizona. Uh, where it all, so you know, Georgia and soon Florida will have six-week bans, which are near total. North Carolina's got a 12-week. Uh, and Arizona, as of this morning, as we're talking, has a 15-week with no exceptions. The other ones have rape, incest exceptions. Arizona doesn't. But there's a court case coming today in Arizona that could restore the 19th century law in the books. That it, that's, a, that's a total ban with no exceptions except for uh, life of the mother. Um, so we'll know that. By the way, like Trump... And in Florida, Trump has to now vote in a referendum. In Florida's a referendum to, for abortion rights. So he's going to be asked, do you support this law in this state which you are campaigning in or this law where you live or this state where it's having a referendum? So it doesn't, it, it doesn't remove him from all the thorny aspects of this issue. It, so he, he thinks he's being, he, what is he really thinking? He thinks he's being clever. He thinks he's, he's lecturing Social conservatives, you don't know how to talk about it. He's like, we, we got to know, you got to know how to talk about this issue. And he spent all this time crafting this statement, thinking like, I have like avoided all the landmines. And he has not. There are so many landmines out there remaining that he's going to have to deal with. 
All right, let's play the last clip. You must follow your heart of this issue, but remember, you must also win elections to restore our culture and, in fact, to save our country, which is currently and very sadly a nation in decline. So, first of all, I skipped the part where he talks about how you have to follow your heart. He went into that a lot, which is actually a pro-choice, you know, well, position. That, that, that's, that, there's so much, I don't want to get to like There's so much word salad in the statement. He, yeah. he wants to be all things to all people. Yeah. And that's really hard to do, like, within the confines of, like, a single statement. Like, sometimes you might, like, say different things to different audiences, but he shoves it all into one statement and hopes that no one's going to call him on it. And look, if uh, – if, uh, if this was 2016, that's a little easier to get away with. But he has a record now that makes it hard to get away with. Well, from a pro-life standpoint, um, I I think – so Trump is saying we got to vote. Don't go too far out on your skis. Don't be too pro-life because we have to win the election. Because if we don't win the election, we can't win the cultural war. We can't legislate, all that stuff. Fine. Fair enough. But think of it from a pro-life standpoint. Abortion rates are up since Donald Trump got elected. Um, Republicans, yeah, send it back to the states where we keep losing. The the pro-life side keeps losing at the state level. Um, So and now you have Donald Trump, who kind of the tip of the spear, if you're a Republican, who is publicly taking in some cases, depending on the word salad, a pro-choice worldview. So how much have we won? Like, just because we, we overturned Roe, but abortions have gone up since then. And in even in red states, we're kicking it back to the states. And even in red states, we're losing. So well, what, I mean, what did we win? At every place this is on the ballot, the abortion rights side has won, but you can't do that in every state. And a lot of those states are in the South where abortion is banned. Uh, so, like, you're totally right on like the national numbers. Uh, it's not if you, if if your interest is in you know saving the lives of babies, you have failed on that score because the number of abortions continues. I mean, no, abortion had gone down quite significantly in the Obama years, uh, and now it's now it's ticking up. Uh, that's because you have you have a mail order uh, abortion pills. You have people who can still travel to states. Um, but it doesn't mean that uh, on the individual level, there aren't people being hurt by this because not everybody has that same kind of access. And and I think we have this in the in the queue here. You know, the Biden ad campaign that that was, the Biden that was dropped on Monday, you know, elevates one of these anecdotes where someone was you know caught in a state you know in a particular particular circumstance where the fact that the you know, the fact like that on a macro level, there are more abortions, wasn't relevant to her individual situation. Yeah, let's play it. It's called Willow's Box. This is a Biden-Harris ad. And you can see that Trump felt like, obviously, he had to get out in front and and define his position and the Republican Party's position on abortion, because clearly this is where Democrats are going to attack him. Bill, uh, so one caveat before we play this. If you're listening to this on the audio podcast, it will not be it will not mean nearly as much to you because a lot of the most potent messages are shown on the screen as a caption or the Chiron. So uh, if you're listening to this, you will not fully appreciate this ad. I could read it, but that would probably sound that would probably be even weirder. So just know if you're listening, uh, you're not going to fully get which Bill, I think this ad, in my opinion is the most effective pro-choice ad that I've ever seen. I, I, I was curious to get your reaction to it. I'm, I, that, that's fascinating. All right, we'll show up. We could talk on the other end. This is one of our willow boxes. This is just filled with some of the things that we had started gathering for her while I was pregnant. Yep. There's her little baby book. This is the outfit that she was gonna maybe wear home from the hospital. All of these. Um, This is the blanket that she was in. And these are her little footprints. Okay. 
I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. So again, there were a, a lot you would have missed if you were listening. You can come to our YouTube page and check it out. But um, at the end, it said Donald Trump did this. That and they're explaining the also in the in the text that uh, she was at uh, 18 weeks. Uh, uh, she was having a miscarriage to prevent an infection. The proper medical uh, procedure would be to have an abortion at that point. She couldn't get one in Texas. She got sepsis. She was in the ICU twice. And now, because of the damage of the infection, she may not be able to get pregnant again. And then it ends by saying Donald Trump did this. And I know, uh, you know, Matt and I, we we are uh, uh, we talk about politics in a very glib way. Uh, I know when when the question of abortion comes up, that can that can really rankle. Uh, and this is you, you don't want to, it's you don't want to talk about this in, in in normal glib political terms like well that's a clever ad that they did there. Uh, it's a brutal ad. It, it is it is emotionally gutting. No matter what your political position is on abortion, it's it, it's impossible to watch that and not be emotionally affected by it. Uh, now you might have a take that says all oh, these cynical bastards in the Biden campaign are exploiting this woman. Then you it doesn't mean you automatically have to look look at it from in a pro Biden way. But I don't think you can walk away from that and have no feeling at, at all. Uh, now, this, this isn't is an of, ad. This isn't an ad about you know a young woman who decided to have an abortion because she wants to be a corporate executive. And this was a woman, a family that wanted to have a child. And it's about the if if you are pro life and you care about the unborn this ad would pull at your heartstrings as mm. well, which is why I think it's very effective and very uh, different. That's why I think it's, and so, so you were saying before, Matt, Trump has to get ahead of this because these attacks are coming. From my perspective, I don't think he wins this argument because he did do it. That, and I, and I, th 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 this ad mm. says to me, that the Biden campaign has done its due diligence, has found the women who have been wronged by this and who are willing to speak about it publicly, willing to be on TV, willing to take that heat, uh, to be able to drop this in April on the day. Like, I mean, maybe he doesn't have more, but like my, my, if I was in the Biden, if I was in the Trump camp, I'd be like, what else does he have? Yeah. How many more of these does he have? Well, uh, Bill, I think that in politics, usually campaigns nowadays, especially at the presidential level, campaigns only matter on the margins, right? I mean, part of it is the charisma of the candidate. Part of it is luck, what's happening in the world at that time. Um, some of it is that issues have built-in skews. If we're talking about this issue, it's always going to help the Republican. If we're talking about that issue, very rarely is it the case that what a campaign, how a campaign executes something is actually decisive in whether or not that candidate wins at the presidential level. Um, this could be the difference. If Biden and the Biden's team can actually make the case decisively that Trump is responsible for Roe being overturned, again, I think it was good that Roe was overturned, but politically, Right now, I think it hurts Republicans. If Biden can, if Biden's team can actually make that case, like, I don't know how many people are really going to see this ad. Once I watched it, I did find it persuasive and compelling. Like, I, I could see that it's very effective. I don't know how many people are going to see it. And that's going to be a lot of what this fight's about. Are you, are you, it goes back to our earlier conversation with people being, and their media bubbles. I'm pretty sure Fox News will not play this ad in its entirety. Well, not not, not as news coverage, although it is getting news coverage, but they might maybe they'll run it on Fox. I don't know where they're placing it. Uh, and this is where the money game comes into play. I mean, as it stands, Biden's got a Biden cash advantage. Yeah. Um, the more money he has, the more ads he can run, the more states he can run them in. You know, there's a you know, I wrote about last week whether or not Biden should play in Florida. Florida is a very expensive state to play in. And so if you make the calculation, you know what? It's light red, but it's red. 
you know, we're just not going to win there. Uh, I can't blow a hundred, two hundred million dollars on ads in that that massive state. It's just I, I got to. I, 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 things are too close in the Midwest. Things are too close in Arizona and Georgia. I got not say Chad, North Carolina, Florida is too rich for my blood. That that would I would understand that calculation. Uh, but if the fact that this the six week ban Florida, the, the US had a supreme a state supreme court ruling there last week, and it's a little convoluted what the impact is. But the short story is the six week ban will go into effect May 1st. It hasn't happened yet. I mean, Florida may may have dri- tilted right in the past few cycles, but it's there's not a lot of indication that it is a socially conservative state. Uh, and so if there is to be a pendulum swing back to the middle of Florida, this would do it. Uh, and so here's, and I think there's at least, I think it's at least valuable for Biden to go hard in May, and see, can I move the needle with an ad blast upon this law going into effect? And if I can make the needle move by June or July, then I got reason to keep going in the fall. And if I can't, then I got to pull back. Um, That's the benefit of having money is that you could do an experiment like that. Yeah. That is a fascinating point, Bill. I guess one problem is, you know, as you get older and times change, it's hard to stay in touch. I mean, there was a time when... I had a pretty good feel like if you had a good ad and you had money to put points up, you know, you would run it after the evening news and people were going to see that ad and you could move numbers with an effective TV ad. I just I mean, now I would have to be YouTube pre-roll ads or like, I mean, people are not consuming information watching Dan Rather anymore. No, it's not. It, but it, it, it can't just be. This is this is why I think what Trump did is not smart politics, because it's not as simple as just placing an ad on the nightly news. You need a multifaceted and ad campaign that hits not that hits TV and social media and different demographics and different kinds of channels and whatnot. And you need the free media component. It's got to spill into the news coverage. It, it needs to have that. That exponential effect, which this ad, this, this ad got news coverage. Willow's Box got free media coverage, so they, they had that expanded reach. And so now it's part of, and they, because it hit the same day as Trump's own statement, you now have at minimum a 24-hour news cycle where you're talking about abortion mainly, uh, although it happened in the eclipse, so the eclipse crowd stuff out, you know, things aren't, can be perfect for campaigns. But the risk for Trump is he doesn't want this campaign to hinge upon abortion because he knows he loses that argument. He wants it to hinge on the border or hinge on Biden's age or hinge on inflation. Uh, And so if Trump is leaning into the discussion, that leads to more free media coverage that expands the reach of the ad campaign. And I'm sure Trump thought... I'm going to knock out this statement in April, and I'm not going to talk about the rest of the campaign. I, I, I checked that box. But it may not be so easy to just check that box if the hits keep coming. I think we do disagree slightly. I think that this, that, that Trump's statement, I think that Trump is very good at muddying the waters and that he will be able to distance himself from Trump's record. That Trump's, Trump's persona as a vulgarian certainly not a social conservative, coupled with his uh, rhetoric and communications, including this statement he issued uh, yesterday, that that will distance him from he Trump. I put it to you this way. If Ron DeSantis or Ted Cruz were the Republican nominee, abortion would destroy them. Trump will fare much better against attacks, even though he's the one who appointed those three justices. Do you disagree with that, Bill? If you think, uh, this is hard to do when we're so close to the subject matter, but if you think you asked a random person, name three things Trump did while he was president, what would they say? Um, Number one, I think 
if you got one answer out of him, you'd be lucky. <laughs> and I think it would be, well, you know, he the economy was a lot better back then. So he the, got the a, economy a, a, going. A policy, a policy. They couldn't tell you. Okay. Okay. He secured let, the border. Let, let's, let's narrow the pool of people who could actually say a policy. All right. Let me tell you something, Bill, um, which is interesting. I've, you know, I, I consume countless hours of podcasts. You wouldn't believe. I, I listen to four or five hours of podcasts a day, probably. It's my number one way of, of, of <laughs> learning and, and, and entertaining myself, probably. And one of the many podcasts I listen to is uh, Sarah Longwell's podcast mm -hmm. called The Focus Group. Mm -hmm. And of course, I watch other focus groups too, you know, like when they're on CNN and stuff. And these focus groups have really, <laughs> you just, I would recommend just listening to them. Well, it, it'd be too painful because it's all, it's all low information voters who say just the total incoherent nonsense, right? It would be the question you just asked me. Would be asked. Sure, I, name the three name the three things Trump has done, and somebody with a southern accent or a very rural. I'm, I'm sitting here in West Virginia. Um, don't don't hate on me, but somebody <laughs> would say like, "Oh, he was great for the economy." Like that's that's their answer to the. His I, I, I I understand. I understand that. So, but but be that as it may, like you can't think of too many other things that Trump actually did policy wise that had more actual impact on human beings. Than the ending of Roe, it, when you think about like what are like what is the the thing that distinguishes the Obama presidency? Well, Obamacare. What is the biggest thing that George W. Bush did? Oh, well, the Iraq War. Uh, you can make a very strong case like ending Roe is the biggest thing that Donald Trump did, and it affected the most people and does so to this day. Uh, I, I think I think you could make that case, and you, you would probably be right. I don't think it's on the tip of people's tongue the way. Obamacare and the Iraq War are well uh, with a hundred million dollars in ads reminding you that it might. That is the question. I think that is the X factor. I like I said earlier. Oftentimes, I don't think campaigns matter that much. Right. Actually, just you know, a fraction of a of a point on the margins. But in this case, if the Biden team can keep doing what they did with that ad and don't just produce ads, but find a way to get people to actually see them. That could be the election. Absolutely. Like this, this, this woman in the ad, I saw like she's she's going to go on the campaign trail. Like she's going to continue to make news. Uh, and that that's a, so I, I take your point that like a low information voter doesn't. It's on the tip of their tongue. Yeah, but I think. When, by the way, this is like, ten years ago, this woman would have destroyed the Republican. I mean, it would have been it would have been like remember Cindy Sheehan. Mm -hmm. Remember her. I do. Couldn't, you couldn't. You couldn't avoid Cindy Sheehan, mm -hmm. and it was very annoying as a Georgia <laughs> W. Bush voter. I wasn't the biggest Bush fan, but I voted for him. Mm -hmm. She was like the fly in the ointment everywhere. She camped outside of his like ranch in Texas, and no, I he still, got re it, still got reelected. Fair point, but I I think today. Uh, there's just too much news. There's too much noise. There's too many other channels. There's there's Netflix. We we haven't even talked about all the the TV shows I've watched, Bill. Well, that'll be well, another I, day, I, maybe. I should say she her big protest was after 2004, 2005. So I shouldn't. So this was not relevant to the re-election campaign. Well, um, I will say this: the Iraq War did serious damage to George W. Bush and to the Republican Party, and I don't think we end up with Donald Trump if it wasn't for that, obviously. Yeah, well, most of that damage happened post-2004. Um, yeah. I mean, it made things a little dicey for him in 2004 because it still was a very polarizing thing, but not quite yeah. enough <laughs> for him to lose, lose the election. But the point I was trying to make before is I think that because, factually speaking, ending Roe is one of, if not the biggest policy legacy that he has, even if a low info voter doesn't go there instinctually when you put it in ads tacitly making that that point the media coverage is going to back that up uh it's not so it, it's not a strain to force abortion of the conversation and pin it on trump because he did actually do it and did actually affect real people and if those people are going to talk that can have a, a synergizing effect all right well there you have it <laughs> it's been <laughs> Good to be back, I guess. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so no, no, I guess nothing else we really need to speak about right now. I think we covered a lot of ground. We did. We were, we're past the 45 minute mark. So we've done due diligence. Um, Bill, anything you want to plug? Well, at the Washington Monthly, we have our new print issue out here. Uh, who got more done? The Monthly's Presidential Accomplishment Index. So we have pages and pages and pages of you know, we we have, we have a one a a fifteen page comparison of all of essentially all of Trump and Biden's policies side by side. So you can sort of decide for yourself who do you think got more done. So it's not a question of things then that we like or dislike as people, you know, on the center left, but just from the president's own agenda, their own perspective, how much did they get done that they wanted to get done? Uh, who was the more impactful and consequential? Uh, and so on top of that comparison, we have about 10 articles, uh, including myself, delving into specific areas and adding additional context, um, making these uh, analyses and comparisons. So I think it's a very useful guide. Uh, I think it helps put things in some broader perspective. And so it's not just about uh, the trials and these personalities and age. You know, we have two presidents with records and we can look at it and say who was the better president based on what they actually did in office. So I do. So it's all up on the website, but you can get the print copy at your at your favorite uh, newsstand. Uh, and uh, uh, what do you got, Matt? Very cool. Well, make sure to read my piece. Uh, at the Daily Beast, where I make the argument um, that pro-lifers have been sort of thrown under the bus by Donald Trump, or certainly the bet that we made or that many made, the deal with the devil uh, that many made has not panned out, despite overturning Roe, as we've talked about, Bill. If you care about a culture of life, if you care about actually the issue, not just the the legislation, not just the law... Uh, hasn't been great, hasn't been a great deal, even by the standards of his number one accomplishment. Um, also, m- I made, listen, I, so I just did a new uh, a podcast with uh, Will Salatan, mm-hmm. and uh, I did one last week with Tom Nichols, and we have a new audio feed. The old Matt Lewis and the News audio podcast is gone or is leaving, and you should subscribe to Matt Lewis Can't Lose on iTunes. You know, wherever you get your podcasts, you have to you have to make a new subscription. You have to choose that feed. You you, you will automatically get that with the old feed. You got it. You've got to go to wherever you get podcasts and type in Matt Lewis can't lose. Subscribe, like, rate, and review so other people can find it too. Um, and of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel here. If you're if you're listening, you should be watching too because sometimes we show those videos now, and sometimes it. But usually it works in terms of audio. Today's uh, The Willow's Box ad, uh, certainly you need to watch to fully appreciate. All right. It's good to have you back, Matt. Good to be back, uh, Bill Share, and we'll see you back here in the DMZ next week. Take care.